Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Vincent, let me start with you. You've initiated um, talks on a potential secondary strike um, in involving your workers in port and rail. Um, just take us through why you decided that this was a necessary action. Thank you very much and good, good evening, Karima. Um, um, we have taken a decision because we realized that the employers were not willing to move at all. And the only way in which to make sure that the strike is beginning to have its impact felt, wherein there could be no, no movements of goods, is to ensure that we block the ports. And uh, because we have members in our union that are, differ are belonging to that particular sector, we have a provision in the Labor Relations Act for us to be able to call for a secondary strike that will be able to assist us in terms of intensifying the current strike. Mm -hmm. Where is the preparations for that secondary strike at now? When does that start taking effect? In fact, we have been receiving reports. It's highly received by our members in those sectors. We have sent out a notice this past Friday, and the notice uh, takes seven days, and out of that will be going all out to ensure that there are no movements of goods from the ports, there are no movements of goods outside. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. M Mr. Lunga, the situation seems as if it's escalating. We see now the potential for a secondary strike. We've already seen <coughs> petrol uh, stations running dry with certain kinds of petrol. We've seen fresh fruit rotting in markets because trucks can't get to them. Um, what, in your view, is going to bring an end to you know this impasse? Thanks. Um, uh, good evening, Karima. The, um, we regret that um, the unions have had to resort to this um, type of action. It is within the law and there is very little that we can do about that. The um, only compromise will bring about an end to this. If parties are fixated on their positions, which we believe the trade unions have been, um, there is no way that we're going to bring an end to this, um, um, uh, to this current impulse. The, um, we believe that from an employer's point of view, we've tried as much as we can to meet the trade union's demand. If I may just, if, you, if we have a bit of time, if I may just take you back. On the 22nd of September, we had an in-principle agreement of 9%. We reached an agreement with the, with the union negotiators. Their responsibility was to go and sell that to their members. They went to their members and uh, that offer was rejected. Last week, Thursday, we also upped our offer. They, the trade union negotiators told us that at least the first year must be 10% in order to reach an agreement. We said over a two-year period that would be difficult for the employers to achieve. However, we can do it over a three-year period. At that time, the Minister of Labor's representatives as well as the CCMA facilitated that deal. Once again, we reached an agreement, in principle agreement, that the trade union leadership could not sell. And therefore, as far as we concern, um, secondary strike, will definitely cripple the economy. However, as to whether or not it is going to improve our, our ability to afford the, the types of demands that the trade unions have put on the table, we doubt that. It's mm -hmm. going to be impossible. Uh, Vincent, mm. essentially Mr. Lunga is saying that your negotiators is not able to sell what they agreed to in the bargaining chamber to your membership. It is in fact not the case. Uh, the negotiators are just following the democratic processes that are provided for in the trade union. And over and above that, we cannot then impose certain things upon our members. And what we know very well is that we have, I mean, even before we, before we left the negotiations, the negotiators made it very clear that, look, this thing is a matter of making sure that we not sell it, but consult over it and to check as to the members can but be able to But in principle agreement of 9%. And not necessarily to say it was an in-principle agreement. It was, it, it was the latest one was not an in-principle agreement. We all agree that the negotiations are still ongoing, but parties shall consult. That, that cannot be said it's an in-principle agreement. And, uh, and uh, on top of it, I think that the employers went out and started saying that they are offering 10% and told everybody outside. Whereas they knew very well that in the manner in which they said, as he says now, that in a third year pro, uh, 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 cycle, then that means that this would have to be a 9%, which was what was rejected anyway. And, uh, and certainly that could not be accepted. And we have to make it very clear that it's necessary for us to become fixated about the genuine demands 
of the workers insofar as the difficult conditions that they face are concerned. It's genuine for us to remain fixated about a double-digit wage increase. Mm -hmm. Let me inter interrupt you there, Vincent. What seems to be the issue here is the way in which the increases are phased in. I think you are both, uh, gentlemen, if I'm not misunderstanding you, agreeing that we are going to double digits. It's a question of when the double digit takes effect. When I spoke with you last, Vincent, you said that um, the cost of living is biting right now. You can't wait for that phase in. Is that something, uh, Lung uh, Mr. Lunga, that you are taking into consideration that we're looking at increased petrol costs, we're looking at increased transport costs for workers, um, that they need that increase not uh, in 2013, but, but, but in fact right now? Yes, the manner in which uh, Kremlin, the um the, the deal was structured. It was structured in such a way that 10% would be for the first year and try and address the, um, the pressure that employees, as the, consu as the, consu as the consuming public, uh, you know, are facing. The, um, the, challenge, the challenge is still affordability on the part of employers. Just to put you, um, uh, just, to, just to create a context over here, the, um, the net profit margin of our industry is 4%. We went out prior to the negotiations with the involvement of the trade unions, all trade unions, not only Satao, as part of our negotiations protocol. We consulted econometrics. We went, we took it a step further, consulted economists. And we were told exactly that based on, on, the, based on the return that the employers are making, an increase, any increase above 8.5% will not only uh, uh, damage industry, but, with you, but will also uh, result in loss of jobs. Loss of jobs, Vincent. Mm. Are you not worried that your demands is going to result in exactly the opposite, that you might have a short-term gain, but in the long run, you might actually lose um, people their employment? Not at all. Actually, the employers are always, uh, I think uh, what he's saying there is bolstered by their views always that are coming from the consultants. They have a lot of money to pay the consultants that come in there, give them all these sorts of opinions that are related to markets and profiteering. They are not at all interested in the well-being of the workers. And we know very well that if they actually radic radically take a decision themselves to transform the sector and make sure that the people that work under the most hazardous conditions, being the truck drivers, that always get their services done, that make them be able to make these margins that they are talking about. If you make a, a margin that is talking about, if he's honest, of, uh, of 30 billion, because one of the companies uh, run 10 overs of about that money, then uh, how, much, how much is that? Why is it so difficult for them to afford a better percentage for the workers? Is because of those kind of consulting talk that they are getting that therefore if they g uh, give uh, better wages then they can compromise job creation. L let, me, let me come in here. It seems as if you both are talking yourselves into a corner here. What is going to give uh, in terms of getting this deadlock out of the way? We're talking about a potential secondary strike. We're talking about job losses and we're talking about very, very big impacts on other sectors of the economy beyond the immediate truck drivers. Um, surely there is a responsibility on both parties to actually see the bigger picture here. Uh, let's start with you, Mr. Lunga. No, I think um, we understand that. Our industry is losing 1.2 billion. That is only our industry. I can imagine that because um, we link to the supply chains of so many other industries, the losses are much bigger than the 1.2 billion. The workers are losing approximately 280 million per week. There are losses here. The violence that uh, has accompanied the strike has caused so much damage to people who are not even involved in the sector. We are fully aware of that. What we're saying is that trade, union, trade unions as our partners, you need to meet us some way. If you're saying, if their negotiators have a mandate to negotiate, then that needs to be clear. Then that is what they need to do. They need to negotiate. If, however, they are saying 12% and nothing else, then why bother coming to the negotiation table? Are you negotiating or are you making yourself, um, painting yourself into such a corner that you can't talk yourself down, Vincent? How can it be 12% or nothing and you say you negotiate? No, no, we, we are negotiating. I think that what makes it very difficult, uh, even for the workers on the ground, uh, to even move away now from 12% is the intransigence from their part uh, uh, on the basis that they, they, they like, they enjoy the top 
uh, to bottom approach of, of authoritarian movements where now they just impose that this is what you deserve, this is what you get, go away. And the workers, the workers get highly frustrated by those. But that does not mean, that is why the workers continue to have the confidence in their leadership and the negotiators. And they are saying to them, go and get us something. That's why they said, get us at least a double digit and make sure that you stick by it, we can be able to come back and accept that. It's not a problem. We are not necessarily saying that we are stuck at a particular point. In fact, they know even themselves that we ask this thing. They are now making acquisitions such as the fact that they cannot trust us. How is it that they cannot trust into democratic processes? Gentlemen, mm. we are unfortunately running out of time. Very clearly we are reaching a situation where you will soon have to come to an agreement because you are sta staring in the face big losses. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Lunga and, and, and Vincent. And that was Penyo Lunga, the chairperson of the Road Freight Employees Association and of course the spokesperson for Satao Vincent Masoha.